Hey, it's so great to be with you this morning. Yes, here I am in my living room. Never dreamed I'd be preaching from my living room, but these are the days we live in. Uh, we're all just trapped right here in our homes. And I know you're at home. I'm glad that you're with us. You may be watching this with your kids, uh, try to get focused, or maybe you got your coffee, you're in your pajamas, uh, maybe with family. You might be alone. You may find yourself in a an apartment or maybe you're in a car or somewhere later on your iPhone or something. But uh, we are trapped like nearly, how about this, a third of the world's population, 2.5 plus billion people have been somehow restricted uh, by this coronavirus. And this pandemic clearly has changed our lives. Uh, we are trapped, we are isolated. And because none of us are an island unto ourselves, uh, except for my maybe my fours, fives on the Enneagram, some of you introverts, shout out to you, living your best life now. But for a lot of us, and really for all of us, to be secluded, to be isolated from others that we love is a real challenging thing. Uh, Stacy and I had, we had a virtual dinner with our family Friday night, and it was awesome to be with everybody, and we're having Zoom calls and all that good stuff, but uh, we're just making it go, and we're getting creative as we move along. But I'm telling you, this centripetal force, this inward seeking isolation is going to do uh, a number on us. And so I want to talk about that a little bit today before we implode. Some of you with, with kids running around uh, feel like, man, my family's just barely going to make it. But we feel like we're in our own prison uh, and that can really weigh on us. And today we're going to talk about the solution. You know, since this COVID-19 uh, thing hit, um, it has really been a, an amazing moment and, and challenge, unprecedented in our lifetimes. And I want us to use this time to really allow God to take His you know, holy searchlight, let the Spirit speak into our hearts and um, expose some things that need to be exposed. Maybe some of you have been uh, feeling that you've been isolated, or how about this turned inward? That's the constant challenge for all of us who want to walk in the way of Jesus, is that we are seeking to serve others. The way of Jesus is always outwardly focused. It's centrifugal force. It's an outward seeking force, and yet we're finding ourselves turned inward, closed in. And so what I want you to do is turn with me to the book of Matthew. That's where we're gonna be, Matthew 11. You can see it there. Matthew 11, 25 through 30 is our passage. This is the key passage we've been looking at in these days. We're gonna put it in context today and focus in. So grab your Bible, um, and I want us to uh, just focus in on the Word of God. Again, this is an unprecedented time, and I am praying for spiritual renewal in my own life personally. Um, uh, different patterns, different you know, disciplines that we need to practice here. I'm so grateful that God, again, has led us in this season, our Lenten season, through an incredible devotional guide that keeps us all focused every day. You're seeing how we're connecting you, with you every day, seeking to help you follow Jesus every day. We're still trying to share the gospel in unprecedented ways. But this, this time is unique. It positions ourselves, positions us before God to experience a personal renewal that we may not otherwise experience. I'm praying for renewal in my own life, for my family. I'm praying for our church family. I'm praying for corporate renewal among us that will never be the same. I want you to join me. I'm praying for revival across the nation and around the world. I believe God is doing a new work among us and I am, uh, I'm excited to see all that he's doing. I'm hearing so many great stories from you, praying for revival in our city and in our nation. Now, other than the obvious, here's what I want to talk about today. I want to ask you the question, other than getting sick, um, why is this crisis so difficult for us? Why is it so frightening? Uh, and, and what I've observed is that it's not just about, uh, you know, getting sick. I think our fears, our anxieties aren't related completely to just getting sick. It's actually related to, our, to a way of life, losing a way of life. It's related to losing our jobs and our, our money and our investments and all of those things. And all that is important. Uh, some of us who, who really find our, our worth maybe in our work or we're not able to do certain things that we were doing. We find our identity in being a doer, a producer, uh, or, or whatever your normal pattern might be. This is a great time for you to just look hard into your life and say, wow, what is it that's driving me? Because we talk about it often, our fears, our anxieties, our deepest emotions point us to our idols. 
And this is such an important time for us to look hard. But you know, there've been some polarizing statements that have been made about people who've said, you know, the great concern is not so much um, human life as it is the American way of life. We might be losing. Now, I haven't heard anyone say that the economy, you know, is more important than a human life. But again, I think that, that so much of what's being talked about, this anxiety, it can lead to even anger, all the questions that are out there, so much of it has to do with a loss of a way of life. And I'm gonna challenge us today to think that it might not be the way of Jesus. In fact, French sociologist Jean Baudrillard, he says this, he points out that in the Western uh, world, materialism has become the new dominant system of meaning. In fact, he says this, atheism hasn't replaced cultural Christianity. He says shopping has. I mean, it's, it's the desire for more. The God of the West is the God of mammon, the one God that Jesus put a name to. Our greatest fears and anxieties reveal where we place our trust. So why are we so afraid? What are we afraid of losing? That's worth asking and thinking about. If you're like me, uh, you're thinking, well, part of my challenge is I don't know when we're gonna be back to normal. And if we are back to normal, is it gonna be normal? Uh, I just wanna get out of the house. I don't know when things are gonna change. You know, none of us really do. Some of you are, are man, I just want my kids to go to school, like go to school, right? Some of you, I, I just want my, my husband or my wife to go to work, would be a really good thing. I don't know if you heard this, but the Olympics, uh, this, this summer, which is a bummer, have been postponed or moved, but you may not have heard that um, they're actually giving all the gold medals to parents who have kids under five years old. So I thought that was a pretty good plan. Imagine that. Uh, finally, parents get the trophies. Uh, that, that's how it ought to go, right? But some of us are, are, you know, really all of us are challenged. And what's really amazing I've seen is this common, there's a real unity around the pain and the fear, the anxiety that we're experiencing. I'm seeing a, a lot of us, our, our country, even the world kind of coming together in an amazing way. I don't know if you saw Christ the Redeemer uh, in Brazil was lit up with um, all the flags of the entire world. I mean, just incredible how God is at work in this time we're, and we're seeing it. But I want you to, you to consider this, that the reason that we're facing so much anxiety, fear and sadness, even anger, is because our desires are not being met, okay? Because our desires are being challenged. And so this morning I want us to ask the question, how can following Jesus set me free from my fears and anxieties? This is the key question, not just for now, but for life. Jesus is the one who can liberate us. So I want you to see that our desires trap us, Jesus liberates us, and then we need to follow Jesus to freedom. This is the Christian life. But again, it becomes so acute in this particular cultural moment. So let's look again, Matthew 11, you have it there in front of you. Matthew 11, 11 beginning with verse 25. And at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Now notice he calls him Father. He's talking about his, this intimacy he has with the Father. That you have hidden things, these things, from the wise and understanding. Now note, wise and understanding really means those who are learned is another translation. Those who are educated. Those who are really kind of self-sustaining, you know, even self-righteous. He's really referring to the scribes and Pharisees, the religious types. And he says, instead of them, your way is revealed uh, to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Jesus first points to the wise and learned, but then he turns to children again as exhibit A of those who enter into the way of the kingdom. Now look at verse 27. All these things, or all things, have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Check out the intimacy here. And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So again, he's talking about this intimate union that he has with the Father, and he's inviting us in, but the only way in is to become like children. So the first thing I want you to see is this. When we don't come to Him like children, 
our desires trap us, right? Write that down. You can take notes in a journal. You can see it there. The irony is this. The desires of the wise and the educated, the self-righteous, lead to bondage trapped in our own self-made prison of anxiety and worry. And Jesus says, here it is, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, that is to say, who are weighted down and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now let's, let's ask the question, why are we burdened and heavy laden? Now you might say, well, gosh, is that because life is hard? Okay, yes, but why do we stay that way? Why do we continue to wrestle? Because we, we don't realize, we don't see and come to Jesus. Jesus says, come to me. But here's the thing, this pandemic puts a spotlight uh, to our ongoing dilemma. Where will we go for help? Many times, and it's happening now, the government doesn't seem to be helping us. I mean, they're, they're working hard, we're praying for our leaders, but the government is wrestling in terms of what to do. Uh, you don't go to your newsfeed to get rest, right? And the hospital workers, doctors and nurses, they are the heroes in this time, this moment. But even they are limited in terms of what they can do, right? We, we see all the challenges. Our schools are closed. Our malls are closed. Our church is closed. The building is closed. Where will we go? We go where we always must go. We go to Jesus. He says, come to me. So instead of bringing freedom and rest, our own plans actually uh, and desires enslave us. They turn us inward. And until you surrender your desires to him, you'll remain trapped. So I want to ask this question. How? How do our desires trap us? Well, here it is, by turning us inward. You see, we think that our desires are the way out, but there's an unconscious conspiracy going on here. Our selfish desires actually turn us inward and then lead us to this unending search for joy and peace and rest that Christ promises us. See, the problem is not desire. Uh, We have God-given desires. The problem is disordered desire. We've talked about this before. Augustine is the one who said that sin is love out of order. See, love has an order. And when we get our love of things out of order, and how about this? The thing we love the most, if it's not Christ himself, then that's what brings all of the chaos into our lives. And yes, unrest and dis-ease. And Jesus says, come to me if you want to find rest. So we think that the way to relieve ourselves of the burden is to become wise and learned, right? More education, more power, more uh, stuff, more money. How much more do you need? Just a little bit more, always. And Jesus is the only one who can satisfy the hunger of our souls. Because here's the thing, Thomas Aquinas is the one who said uh, that, that he was asked, what will it take to satisfy uh, human desire? And he said, everything. You see, our desires are unlimited. Our desires are eternal. Human desire is eternal. And only God is the eternal one who can meet our needs and fulfill our desires. And Jesus says, watch this, children aren't like that. Children aren't always seeking for more and more and more. Now, some of you parents might think, no, no, my kids want more. They want everything. But we've, we've all seen it. It's the kid who's playing in the box that the toy came in. You see, kids... They they get what they have, they see what they have, they recognize it, and it is enough for them. And again, your parents might be thinking, no, my kids always want everything. No, 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 listen. No, parents want everything for their kids. Because this is Jesus' point. Kids, children have to receive. Children, some of your children aren't going to eat anything until you give them food. They can't feed themselves. They can't take care of themselves. Children... They have to be given stuff, right? That's what Jesus is saying here. To become like a child is to come and say, I need you. I'm desperate. I can't do this on my own. And so we have to come to him, watch this, in our own terms. I mean, under his terms, not our own. You see, what happens is we are now faced to live. That's what's so challenging here. Not by our own terms. We can't live our lives on our own terms. 
We have to live with all the restrictions. But this is, the, again, a, a kind of a, an analogy of life in the kingdom. We can't come to God on our own terms. We come to him on his terms. And his terms mean that we humble ourselves, we become like children. So this is an important time, such a key time, to get a grip on our stuff and all of our junk and allow the Spirit to speak into our lives. We must come to ourselves and, and, and come under his terms and not our own. So how do we end up in our lives? If you're like me, you're like some of you, you know, realizing, man, I've got some time on my hands. I'm not driving half the day or I'm not at the office. Uh, I, I'm, I'm now, you know, life is getting a little simpler as we think about simplicity here. Why, why is it that we get so busy? Why does life become so con complex? There's an unexpected parable here. We work so hard. Check out the irony. We, we're trying to satisfy all of our desires. We climb our, the ladder. We get a better job, better car, bigger house, and then we're trapped in it. We're entombed with all of our stuff. And this is what happens in life. You might be thinking, well, Jeff, I don't own, I mean, I own stuff, but my stuff doesn't own me. Again, let our deepest emotions your anxieties, your challenges, even the anger that seems to come to the surface, let it reveal the idols in your life. See, do you have a, do you have a greater passion? I'd, I'd said it this way. Do you have a greater passion for Jesus or, 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 or for your secure financial future? I mean, what are your great dreams for your kids? You want them in the right school or do you want them to grow up to follow Jesus every day? You say, well, well can I have both? Maybe, maybe not. Do you want your, your young people to grow up and go to the right college? Or are you seeking to train them up in the way they should go, in the way of Jesus? What, what is really the focus of your life? This is a great time to center and get your mind around that. Are you more concerned, again, about your financial security moving forward? Or are you more, more, are you more interested, more passionate about glorifying God through this process and, and through every day of your life? You see, here's what happens. Our desires trap us. They, they close us in. They turn us inward. But watch this. Jesus liberates us. And he alone can set us free. Look at what he says in verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Now, the yoke meant two things. You know that the yoke, perhaps you know this, was, was, is placed on an animal, right? So that the master could guide the animal. The will of the master is being accomplished through the animal. In fact, when the animal would, would not resist or submit to the master's will, it was called a stiff, that's where we get the word stiff-necked. It's a stiff-necked people. A stiff-necked animal says, no, 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 I'm not going to go. I'm unwilling to submit. But the yoke also was, was, uh, was a word that meant it referenced the rabbi's teaching. So, so it was the yoke of the rabbi that the disciple would submit or come under uh, the application, the interpretation, application of the way of the rabbi. So Jesus, you see, is contrasting his yoke with the way of the world, or I could say legalistic, burdensome, religious um, you know, the heavy, self-righteous, how about a self-salvation plan? Always never ending, never stops. And notice his rescue leads to rest. Let me ask you this, what do you need more in these days than rest? I'm talking about soulful, peaceful rest. All of us need that. What do you need more than that? Jesus says, come to me and I will give you Rest. So I'm going to ask the question again on this one. How? How does he liberate us from the desires that trap us by changing our desires? That's how he does it. You can see it there. We come to him and he properly orders our desires. He right-sizes our desires. See, desires are changed, watch this, in proportion to him. Okay, so, so he aligns our desires as we centralize our focus in proportion to who he is. And we set our hearts on him and he himself becomes the center 
the focus of our lives. It's this, this, this explosive power of a new affection that we talk about. It's the heliocentric universe or, or galaxy. All of the planets find their place. Everything's ordered around the sun. Your life then finally gets ordered around Jesus. I wonder if you're like me. Um, how many of you have thought during this time, I'm going to order, I'm going to reorder my closet. I'm going to order things in my pantry. I know Stacy and I, we're going, even before we got to this COVID-19, we're going to, uh, we're going to, we're going to spring cleaning, right? I've got to clear out my closet, or I should say, yeah, my side of the closet, Stacy would tell you. But, but we're going to get to that, right? Hasn't happened yet. Uh, but here's what, here's, here's the thing. We all love to order our lives because everything, we always tell our kids this, when they were growing up, we'd say, hey, everything, everything has a place, right? Everything in its place, there's a place for everything. That's what it was. Every, there's a place for everything and everything in its place. We, we, we love to, to get things in order. We love to, to get our lives in order. And simplicity, watch this, is putting things in place, putting things in their proper place. But here's the thing. Simplicity will never happen apart from focus, a radical Focus and the only radical obsessive focus in your life that will not kill you is Jesus. He's the only God that will rescue us from ourselves because our desires trap us. Jesus liberates us. So watch this. Finally, we have to follow Jesus then to freedom. He is the way to freedom. He alone will pull us out. Look at what he says in verse 30. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Look at this. It's a twofold blessing. Not only does he lead us to rest, but his way is easy and light. Jesus is the burden bearer. He's the load lifter. He is the way maker. So I asked our question again, how? How does this happen? Through simplicity. That's it. Simplicity is the pathway to freedom. And so, so look at this. There's a twist. Specifically, or, 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 or I would say it this way. Simplicity is not only changing you know, our schedules. It's not getting our lives in order, balancing all things, getting off your phone, or getting rid of so much stuff. Instead, it's a reprioritizing of desire. It's a restructuring of your desire. It is slowing down. It's all of those things. But you will never experience rest until Christ becomes the center focus of your life. We've talked about that a bit in this Easter season. One thing, one focus. See, most of us know uh, that we need, a, we need a sense of balance in our life. Most of us know, you know, if I had a healthier rhythm or if I were eating better, I, I, I need to do a better thing. But here's the thing. It's like a lot of diets. It's like a lot of commitments we make, even during the Lenten season. Uh, we start off with good intention, but we fail to stay committed. See, ultimately, simplicity doesn't lead to freedom. Watch this. Jesus leads to freedom. See, like all the spiritual disciplines, they're simply pointing us, positioning us to be with Jesus and abide with him. The problem is not complex, complexity up against simplicity. The problem is distraction up against focus. The only way to get your life in order, to get your desires in check, is by seeking him first above all things. You see, freedom is found not simply by practicing the way of Jesus. Watch this. Freedom is found in Jesus. It's found in Christ himself. So what does this mean? Well, he said it more explicitly in Matthew 6, In fact, let's say this together right where you are. Say it. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. They'll be added to you. There's only one first. And Jesus is saying that he is not one of many ways to freedom. He is the way. He's saying that he and his kingdom is the way. You know, many of us have heard that verse and we like the latter part of that. And all these things will be added. Oh, good. So I follow Jesus and all these things will come along, right? I'll get these things. But watch this. In context, when you read this, Jesus and the writers of the New Testament, they put the number of material needs at a whopping two things. Check it out, food and clothing. 
Not even shelter is in that. All right? Food and clothing. And evidently we've been thinking, man, I've got to have more toilet paper. I've got to, I mean, everybody's on the move to get whatever they need. And that's always the rat race we find ourselves, particularly here in North Dallas. Evidently that's all we need. Paul said it this way in 1 Timothy 6, 8, but if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Food and clothing. How how about that? Why could he say this? And and let let me me ask you this or challenge you with this. How can you say this? How can we, as where our lives are being simplified, we can't go to all our favorite restaurants, buy all the stuff we want to buy. What a blessing this is for us to realize I can live with less. And so this thing of simplicity can become now a greater way of life because here's the thing. How can Paul say it? How can I say it? Because Jesus becomes our food. And you might go, oh no, Jeff, I still need food. How much food? We have plenty of food, right? Jesus becomes our sustenance. He is the bread of life. You see, he he is, he is, he's all we need to wear. We're going to have clothes. We've got plenty of clothes to wear. Jesus becomes what we wear. He clothes us in his righteousness. He covers us in his grace. And that is enough for us. You see, our desires are infinite. And he alone is the one who can fill all of our desires. Jesus said it this way explicitly in John. I am the way. I am the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And listen, I want, you, I want you to hear this. Jesus doesn't just show us the way. He is the way. He's not a personal trainer. He, he's, not, he's not a financial planner. He's not a life coach. You don't even follow him somewhere. You get him. And then you abide in him and he's enough with whatever life brings to you. Even a pandemic like we're experiencing right now. This is why in John 8, 36, it says, so if the Son has set you free, you're free indeed. You will be free indeed. Free from your busyness, free from consuming, searching, clicking, shopping, always wanting more, always the next thing, bigger, better. So listen, here's the word for the week. Kids, if you're still with me, young people, listen. The word for the week, simplify. Simplify. Simplicity comes through simplifying. We actually do something. We slow down. We stop. What a blessing this has been in so many ways. I've seen more families walking in my neighborhood, more parents with kids than I have ever seen. What we need is a biblical theology of limits, limitation of time, stuff, food, Uh, even limits of our own abilities, capacity, energy. In these days, we're forced to buy things, think about this, for their usefulness, not based on their status. And and in these days of, of kind of a forced fasting, reject anything. Here's what simplicity looks like. And reject anything that, that leads you uh, to a, to an addiction, a develop a habit of giving things away. Uh, uh, simplify, simplify, become debt free, develop a deeper appreciation of creation, of quiet, of beauty, of each other. Listen, you must recognize that Jesus is the only liberator and there is no one, no salvation apart from anyone else except under the name of Jesus, no other name on heaven or earth that can rescue you from your sins. So watch this, our desires, they trap us. Jesus is the liberator and we must follow him to freedom. I want us to pray together. Would you just, let's bow our heads right where you are and just close your eyes with me. And I want us to to just praise him I want to ask you, friend, as we close, you're listening somewhere. Somebody is hearing my voice right now. And you need to close your eyes and focus on Christ and just say, Lord, I give you my life. Friend, the reason your life is so chaotic is because Christ 
is not your Savior. Perhaps you have never received him as Savior and Lord, leader, rabbi of your life. Say, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross for me. You took my sin upon the cross. You died in my place. You were buried and you rose again so that I might live life resurrected, real life, and then live forever with you. So, Lord, I give you my life. Lord, we thank you that in you we find the simple truth. You are enough. Even in this moment, you're enough and you have us in the palm of your hand. You're caring for us. You love us. You forgive us. And then you bless us. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. And everybody together said, amen and amen. <laughs>